morning again. Uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 through 5. I'll read one verse and then you read the next. Judge not that you not that you be not judged. Verse 3, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Together, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Amen. Amen. How you doing? Okay, uh, good. Turn to someone again say, it's good to see you. Um, there are some new guests here. I, I, I welcome you um, to CMC. Uh, we're here in Matthew 7. We're going through the book of Matthew, the first sermon of Jesus. And here we are to a very uh, familiar passage in which is used in a myriad of ways, in so many different ways, right? So have you ever, ever heard someone's, you know, maybe they, sometimes they unknowingly quote this uh, verse, but they say, don't judge me, you know, and, you know don't judge me. And because if you judge me, you'll be judged the same way. And they're using this verse, but they're using it very, very incorrectly, and that's what we're going to get to into today. But the first thing before we get into the meat of that is this question, okay? Why do we judge to begin with? Why are we, uh, maybe, you know, not, not everyone would admit it, but why is it that most of us are inclined to judge? Um, there's different uh, levels of judging, or there's different kind of variations of judging. There's prejudice, prejudging someone, maybe ba based on their color or um, their their background or finan financial status or physical appearance or whatever. There is that kind of judgment. But why is it that we, as people, judge? Uh, and the answer comes from Scripture. Okay, it comes from the very beginning and how we're created. We are created in the beginning by the creator of the universe to be perfect, to be righteous, to be holy. We weren't created to, to have faults. We were created to know, and it's still written on our hearts, as the, the Bible says. The law of God is written on our hearts. We know the difference between right and wrong. Most of us. If you don't have any kind of con concept of right and wrong, that's a sickness. That's something seriously wrong with the individual. But for the most part, even little children know that when they do something wrong, they're like, uh, especially when they get caught. And that, that goodness or righteousness or law is written on our hearts, and that's why we're so quick to judge because we are created originally to be good. That's our original design, to know what's right and wrong and to be able to be right was how God made us. So that's hardwired in us. So when we see something wrong, the initial reaction isn't like, oh, that's just, you know, and, and a lot of people have that kind of thinking of, you know, that's, that's that person's truth and I have my truth and he can do whatever he wants, but, and we're going more and more in that direction. But originally, that's not how we were designed to be. And that's why we judge. Because we know we have, we are pre-wired to have, to have, uh, to know what's right and wrong and a desire to be right. We want to be right. So, the passage today says, though, do not judge. Judge not that you not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. That's the key. With the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. It's not just don't judge, period. 
judge not, why? So that you would not be judged because with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. So how do we break this down? Okay, let's break this down in a couple ways. There is man-made laws that come from, in most societies, come from a, a basic fundamental, you know, coming from the word of God. You have man-made laws, laws that are meant to protect us, laws to ensure our rights as citizens, laws that are given so that other people don't abuse us or other organizations or maybe even government itself doesn't abuse us. Laws are there to protect us. Laws are also there to allow just and fair treatment for all. Laws are there to also establish order so there's not chaos. Could you imagine if there was no law for stealing? You could, it, was not, it was not legally, there was no law to say do not steal. And you could just go, someone could just walk in here and just steal. Laws are there to protect us. Imagine if there was no speed limit on this road right here and kids were walking back and forth and there was no 25 miles speed limit and you could just go 100 miles per hour if you wanted to. That would be dangerous. So laws are there to protect us, to keep things in order, prevent chaos. And laws also identify the beliefs of that society. Some societies have different laws. Some societies say you can marry multiple wives. Some societies have laws that, are, that define them. And if you break those laws, there are consequences. Here in the United States, uh, of course, Mike would, be, uh, would know much more, more in detail. Uh, but if you break a law, either a judge or a jury will give a sentence. There are consequences for breaking the law. There's punishment for breaking the law. And it's there to keep order, and not just order, so that there is justice and fairness for everyone. So when it says do not judge, when we talk about the law, the law is good. Now, I'll get to the point. OK, I'll get to the point. How is it good? So God's law, based upon his word, everyone knows the main you know, the, when we think about the law, what do you think about? You think about the Ten Commandments, yes? Dun, 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 dun. Ten Commandments, you know? And if you break those Ten Commandments, like, oh, you know, like, this is, the, this is the law of God, right? And let me read those for you. It says, Ten Commandments, just listen carefully. It says this, you shall, the first one, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day, four. Fifth, honor your father, your mother. Six, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false, false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet, is the, is the ten. And those ten laws, if we simplify it, is this. Loving God, the first four how you approach God, how you love God, and then the, the, the other six is how you love others. And Jesus himself organizes that law, all the laws, into two major ones, okay? Love God, love others, that's the way the law is a good thing because it points us to how we were originally created to be. We were not created to be separated from God. We were not created to kill each other or hate each other. We were created to love each other. In, as far as we're connected to our loving relationship with our creator, we were created to love others. So what happened to that relationship? And this now is one of the main uses of the, of, the, of the law now, the Ten Commandments. And Jesus also tells, about, tells, tells us of that as well. 
the main use, one of the main uses of the law now is to show us, to point to us that there's a problem. That yes, we were originally created to love God, we were originally created to love others, but the Ten Commandments shows us that something's wrong now. It's to show us to be conscious, to be aware that there's something terribly wrong with the way that we are now. And the, the law is pointing to that problem. Uh, a lot of times we look at the law and we're, we're trying to keep it. And as we're trying to keep it, it becomes a measurement of, how, of my standing with God. But that's not how the law works. It, there is a sense of how it works. It works in that sense, too. It's, but the law, Romans 3.20, clearly shows us what the law is. One of the main purposes of the law is, it says, Paul writes, before Paul kept the law, he thought he was perfect. He thought, I'm perfect, I keep the law, I'm righteous, I'm saved through my zeal, through my efforts, and that's what he thought. And after meeting Jesus on the road to Damascus, and after spending time with his creator, and with the God that he had, he thought the way that God worked, that's what he thought, and he met Jesus, and then now he he realizes that the law is not there to keep it and be righteous. Romans 3.20. The law's purpose is not that you keep it to be righteous. Rather, the law's purpose is that you be conscious of sin. Conscious of sin. Conscious in front of you to know it. Oh my gosh, I, I am a sinner. And in front of the law, Romans 3.23 and Romans 3.10, that entire chapter, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who does good, not even one. There is no one who seeks God, not even one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The law puts all of us on the same boat. Amen? Amen? And that's its very important role. It's not, the law's, perp, law's function isn't to show us who's better or who's worse, who's more righteous and who's not. That's not how the law is intended to function. The law's intention and function, main purpose, is to put everybody in the same boat as a sinner, unable to keep it, unable to be righteous. There is no one who can except for one. And that's where the good news of the gospel comes in. And Jesus, from his first sermon, proclaims it in Matthew 5, as we started months ago. I have not come here to remove or change the law. And not even a dot, not even a T, a cross T, to the dot, to the cross T, I have come here to fulfill it. How does he fulfill the law? Because he's the only one who kept it perfectly. He's the only one who can. Because he's the only one without sin. And that's the good news. So the law is good. And the, the, the passage says, be, be careful, don't judge because with the Way, with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Now, if you use it as a measuring stick and like, oh, I don't do that. I don't steal. I don't murder. I don't cheat. I don't this. I don't that. I don't lie. I don't do this. I, I'm not as bad as other people. If that's how you're using the law, it's going to be used on you the same way. Are you sure? Are you sure you don't steal? Are you sure you don't have lust? And Jesus points it out before he gets to this part of the sermon. He points it out. If you have lust in your heart, you've already committed it. If you have hate or anger for someone, you've committed murder. And the way that the law was used back then also for divorce, it's the same thing today. Divorce was never part of God's perfect plan. The two become one, one flesh. But back in the Old Testament, 
people would come to Moses and they would complain, my wife this, my wife that, and Moses would make the stipulation and custom, and people would abuse the law. Come up with reasons, oh, she's not doing that, so okay, I'm gonna get a divorce. And they would divorce freely. And this is another thing that Jesus mentions also in his first sermon. With the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. When does the law become, now the second part of the passage now, when does it become a log in your eye? Can you imagine a log in your eye? A log. It's not even a branch. It's a log. You guys have, have you guys ever seen a log? I don't know if I've, I've seen a log a few times, but you know, like a log cabin where you put a log and you make a house and you cut out little divots in it and you stack it up. That's a, that's a, it's a log. Can you imagine a log in your eye? Not just blocking your eye, it's in your eye. It completely, you're completely blind. Not, not, not only blind is not the right word, it's, the, it's not just an obstruction, it's like a, that's the imagery Jesus gives. What is that log, okay? Is when we do not understand the law correctly. When we use the law, again, for our own personal benefit, when we use the law, holding the law, thinking that we can attain righteousness and holding it over others. I don't do this, but you do. So the, the second point today is we need to take that log out of our eye. We need to take that law out of our eye. So what does that mean? What does that mean? Does it mean that we take with, that the law is bad or we remove the law? Does it mean that we become lawless? Oh, okay, I'm going to remove this log from my eyes so that I could be free. No law. Absolutely not. The law is good. The law is good, and it's the way that the law is used. Taking the log out of our eye is taking the incorrect uses of the law. Holding, thinking that we are attaining righteousness by our own works and holding it over others. That's a log in your eye. Or taking the law and using it to your own benefit. That's a log in your eye. And Jesus was trying to remove that through his sermon, but they weren't getting it. What is a log in your eye? It's religion. It's religious Christian life. It's a work-centered life. It's a prosperity-centered life is what the law is, using the word to get prosperous or to be prosperous. I believe in Jesus, why? Because I want to be prosperous. I believe in Jesus, why? Because I, I want to be healthy or I want to be, I want to be you know, financially stable or I want to be this or I want to be, want to be that. Another log that's in our eye is the thought that we're better, that we're more righteous because of those works. That if I'm a good person, I'll be okay. That's a log also. I just be a cool, good person. I'm not going to be mean to other people. And, and that's a blinding log in your eye. The way that the law is not working properly. If I keep the law, then I'm, I'm okay. Those people over there that break the law, I'm not as bad as them. That's a log in your eye. Some of the questions that the Pharisees, the keepers of the law, the doers of the law, would ask Jesus show us clearly how that log works. Pharisees, keepers of the law, they were teachers of the law, would come to Jesus and say, what must I do to be saved is a question. Jesus, teacher, not master, not God in the flesh, teacher, coming to test Jesus. What must I do to be saved? How can I be? What can, 
What, what can I do to be righteous? What's the answer to that? Nothing. You can't do a thing to be righteous. When you move the law, you can see it. There's nothing I can do to be righteous before God. That is what the law is stating. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is nothing you can do to be righteous before God. If there was, you wouldn't need Jesus. If there was, Jesus wouldn't have to die. He would just say, come on, guys. Just step it up. Be more, be more good. <laughs> Keep the law better. Come on, guys. And this is what this is the, such a big misunderstanding. Okay, we're going to be like Jesus, and we're going to walk the walk and talk the talk. And if we walk the walk and talk the talk, then we'll be saved. Then we'll be saved. No, you won't. The other comments that, 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 that they make to Jesus, when Jesus is eating with tax collectors or prostitutes or beggars, the lowest low of society, at least in their eyes, they come to Jesus and say, Jesus, do you know who you're eating with, dude? Do you know? Those are sinners. Those are the worst people. Do you know? And Jesus turns to them and says, yeah, I do. But you don't know. I've not come here to save the righteous, he says. I've come here to save them, which you are one of them, but you just don't know because you got this log in your eye. So how do I remove it? The log, by the way, keeps you from seeing everyone else too. Keeps you from seeing yourself. Keeps you from seeing everyone else. It keeps you from seeing God's ultimate covenant for you. God's ultimate covenant was not just for the nation of Israel. It was for the world. It was for all nations, all peoples, all colors, all tongues, all ages, especially the children from all nations. From Genesis 12, that's the original covenant. And because of the log, they couldn't see it. They couldn't see themselves. They couldn't see others. And they lost God's covenant for their people, for his people. So how do I remove this log that's in my eye? How do I remove it? First, acknowledge you have to be conscious of sin. The law that's in our eyes, ironically, it's the same thing that can free us if we see it correctly. Romans 3.20. Be conscious of it. That there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one righteous that includes you and includes me. Acknowledge it. Be conscious of it. Beg for the spirit of God as Jesus starts his sermon. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Realize, acknowledge your need for God's spirit. Daily. I can't do it on my own today. That's right. You probably could. But what God desires is that you totally, fully rely on him. And you beg for it. It, begging is not just the posture, it's the ultimate, it's knowing that you need it. When you have nothing, that's when you're, that's, that's the imagery of that word poor. When you have nothing, nothing, and you're begging for food and water, you're begging for it because you know you need it to survive. And Jesus starts his sermon with, blessed are the poor in spirit who beg for the spirit of God because they know they need it. That's how you start. There is no one who is good. There is no one righteous, not even one. We are totally depraved. A lot of people think that good people go to heaven. Do good people go to heaven? If good people go to heaven, no one gets in. No one. If bad people go to hell, guess what? Everybody goes to hell. There is only one whom is righteous. There is only one who is holy. It's God himself. And we're created in his image. And this is the beauty of the good news of the gospel. God becomes a man. 
He becomes flesh. The word becomes flesh. God of creation, holy, righteous, perfect, creates humans in his image with a choice, with the will. And Adam, the perfect man and the perfect woman, Eve, were given a choice. Not, it was it was God's perfect in design and creation, given a choice, and instead of believing and trusting the creator, they chose to believe the lie of Satan. They ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of fruit and evil, good and evil, and there, there is the original sin, the beginning of it all. And because of that original sin, man was instantly separated from God, separated from their creator, fish out of water, God created fish to live in the water, trees in the ground, birds in the sky, human beings, you and me, created to have an intimate relationship with God. Not just once a week on Sunday or just when something bad happens. Oh, God. We are created to be, have our sustenance in him always, to, that, it, it, that it control our mind and our heart and our thoughts, our emotions. No other part of creation is created that way. Nothing except for humans. And God, in his holiness and righteousness and perfection, becomes one of us. Perfectly human, perfectly God. That's the only way. And he walked on this earth and he perfectly kept the law. Perfectly. He was loving God, obedient to God, and loving others. And that love was displayed on a cross 2,000 years ago for all to see. It's not just a man, Jesus. There's God, the Son of God, hanging on a tree, becoming sin. He could instantly come down from that tree by a snap of the finger. He has the power to do it, but he doesn't. He's hanging there, his mouth silent. His power contained and not exercised. And there, he dies. He becomes sin. He makes the way so that we can be with God again. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a Superman story. A Spider-Man came down from, you know, and he, it, he was a real person. And he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Romans 5.8 says, God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. John 15.16, just in case you get it confused. Don't think that you have chosen me. I have chosen you. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, before the creation and foundation of the world, we are chosen in Christ. I don't know how that works. Before God created the world, that's how powerful God is. There's no time. There's no beginning. There's no end. He just sees everything in one picture. Before you were born, before the world was created, he chose you by name. Why? Because we did good things? No. We weren't even born yet. How could we do th good things? He's chosen us by name and he's prepared good works for us to do. Amen? It's not the works that save us. He chooses us, he gives us grace, and now it's prepared for us to do good works. There's an order of things. It's always Jesus first. It's always God first. It's what he's done and how we respond to that. So what do we do to remove this log? Immerse yourself. First, understand the law properly. It's like a mirror. Yes, I am a sinner. And immerse yourself in the love of God. Immerse yourself in Christ. Focus your eyes on Christ. His righteousness, his goodness, and then you'll start to see things more clearly. See that the cross that he took was supposed to be yours. The punishment that he took was supposed to be yours and mine, the world's.
see that cross and accept the forgiveness of your sins. It's the gospel, guys. It's a gift. You can't pay for it. You can't work for it. There hanging on a tree was a man named Jesus 2,000 years ago. He died. He claimed to be God. He died on the cross. He was put in a tomb. And three days later, he physically walked out of that tomb. And the gift of salvation is free. Revelations 3.20 says, Jesus himself says, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. If you're listening to the gospel right now and you're listening about Jesus and you're hearing it and you're like, oh, and you find it, you're finding it believable, that's the voice of Jesus and the word of God knocking on your heart and saying, hey, hey. And Revelations 3 says, anyone who opens the door, hears my voice and opens the door, Jesus, God promises to go in, in to the home, to the heart, dwell, be with. When you eat, when you sleep, when you run, when you walk, when you fall, when you cry, when you're happy, when you're sad. Promises to be in, to live with forever. That's the promise. And then that restoration, it's restored. We're not perfect by any means, but the spirit of God in us is perfect. Our body and flesh may be rotting away. Our minds may be crazy sometimes here and there. But the original way that we were made becomes restored. The spirit of God becomes living inside of you. And then you need to feed that spirit. So I bless you in Jesus' name that you receive the gift of salvation. And if you have, unravel that gift. Open it up. Don't put it in the closet. Oh, I got the gift. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to put it away in my closet. (laughs) Or I'm going to put it away in some compartment of my house that I go in every week, one time. Right? Open it. Daily. Enjoy. Enjoy the gift of salvation. Amen? Amen. And the final part of this is this. Then you remove not a log that's in your brother's eye, but the speck. In some translation, it says gently. In other translations, it says you can clearly see a speck. A speck is like a dot, you know, in in someone's eye, right? Gently. So what does that look like? I bless us in Jesus' name that CMC as a church would be able to gently remove that speck in each other's eyes. I I, I don't know how, you know, we have very special guests here for the first time, I heard one, one of the guests, it was their first time in church. And I would hope and I pray that your first experience of church would be a good one. And it would be one where you could feel supernatural connection, supernatural love, forgiveness. You know, that's what I would hope. Please, come in. Come in. Come in. It's okay. Welcome. The image of church that is painted in the Bible, the way that unbelievers are supposed to be attracted to us is through what they see. Someone should walk into a church that is enjoying Christ, that is full of Christ, the full of the Spirit of God, and they should be like, what is going on in here? What's going on in here? They look different, you know, they... They're, they're, they're from different, maybe financial brackets and statuses, and, they, you know, they're not in the same line of work, but what is this love that they're experiencing? What is this forgiveness that they're experiencing? What is this, is what they should feel. And that's how we gently remove specks in each other's eyes. Yes, we all have specks in our eyes. Yes, amen? But it's through love. It's through the fruits of the Spirit, love, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, 
faithfulness, self-control. All these fruits of the Spirit are how? So I'll leave you with this finally this week. Love God. First know the love of God. Love him. That's how you're made to be. Trust me. Yes, food is good, and the other things that physically make us happy are good too. And there's no need to fast and not eat those good foods. Eat good foods. Amen? But make sure you eat the real food, the spiritual food. Man shall not live on bread alone. Feed your spirit. Feed your, feed your soul. Receive the love of God. Return it in praise and thanksgiving and gratitude. Love God and love others. Okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, again. I especially thank you for bringing, Lord, your precious people, your creation to this place, Lord, some for the first time. I pray, Lord, that you would open all of our hearts to your word, to your truth, to Jesus, whom has died on the cross for all of our sins, who has risen from the dead, proving that we can trust overcoming death, being victorious over death, and now offering that gift, knocking on the door of our hearts. So I pray, God, that you open our hearts, that as we hear your word, that we open that door, that you would become Lord of our, this day, this, this moment, and for the rest of this week, the rest of our lives, Lord, would you be Lord and master of our life, Help us, Lord, to love you, to know your love, to love you, and to love others this entire week. We thank you and pray these things in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Amen.